Hi everyone, my name is Nase DeSanders of Borrowing Tape and I am here with Steven Kayak, the writer and director of Shoplifters of the World, a comedy drama about a group of small town teens who gripe with the loss of the disbanding of their favorite band, The Smiths. Thank you for being here today, Steven. My pleasure. So Shoplifters of the World opens with the words based on true intentions. Can you elaborate on that for us, please? <laughs> yes. Um, it is based on uh, an urban myth about a Smiths fan uh, who uh, in the 80s in Denver, Colorado, uh, was so heartbroken that his favorite band broke up that he, uh, he planned to take over a radio station in his hometown uh, and a commercial radio station that just played top 40 hits. Uh, and uh, he wanted to force him to play the Smiths uh, all night. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, he didn't go through with it. Uh, he ended up losing his nerve, calling a security guard over and asking him to call the police uh, instead of just going home and pretending like nothing happened. So he kind of, I felt it, it, you learn as you research the story that he was in a, a, a kind of a desperate state, really needed some help. So, uh, you know, he asked the police to be called. He was taken away. And I think the last thing he was heard to be saying as they put him in the car was, I just wanted them to play my music. Um, so it's a sweet little story. And uh, it, but it, it blossomed into this myth of this takeover at the radio station to a point where, you know, it's kind of become part of Smith's lore. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Lorianne Hall, who has the story by credit on the film, grew up in Denver. And one night we were just, kicking around ideas and having cocktails. And uh, she said, dude, you remember that thing that happened in Colorado when the Smiths broke up? And I'm a huge Smiths fan and I had never heard this story before. So uh, it really sparked uh, my imagination and it just sounded like the perfect frame uh, for a story. Like let's, let's let him have his, his glory, right? Let's let yeah. him actually take over the station and, and just see what happens. Yeah, that's really cool. And I'm glad the real person was able to get help at the end as well. Yeah, so, I mean, he, it's apparently he's it really turned him around. Um, uh, there's, there's some stuff written about him online. Uh, I wish we'd been able to find him. We kind of yeah. researched it as we were going. And really, the only things you can find were, you know, things we got from the library in Denver by just calling them up. Uh, so, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. So you're known for films about music and bands. Why is this a topic that you gravitate toward? Um, I just think I always wanted to be in a band, you know? I mean, I was that kid who worked at the record store in high school. I collected vinyl. I played in bands uh, growing up. Uh, it just always was around me. It's, it's what I love. Um, I always say like the films are kind of like my version of, of making mixtapes for my friends, you know? I'm, I'm a little older than you. Uh, I grew up in the 80s where like the mixtape was like a total art form, you mm -hmm. know, uh, just trying to turn your friends on to new sounds and introduce people to new music. So um, it, it's kind of like that. I mean, I just love music and musicians. I love the creative process. I love learning about new music and I love telling these stories. And it's, it's a way to just turn people on and to tell a story uh, with music. Yeah, it's very cool. So what was your original introduction to the Smith? Um, uh, I grew up uh, in Massachusetts, a uh, little town on Cape Cod, and uh, we had a great college radio station. It's actually still there, WKKL, Cape Cod Community College Radio. Uh, it's great. Um, and uh, Boston had a great music scene. Uh, so we just had really, uh, sorry about that. We had um, just really great, um, great music uh, growing up, you know, that wasn't in the mainstream. And they, they just dropped How Soon Is Now one day. I mean, I must have been 14, 13, 14 years old, um, maybe a little older. Um, but I just, I, I can, I remember, I can picture my bedroom and the speakers and the little cruddy old stereo I had. And I just remember the hearing that tune um, and not even really knowing what it was. You know, I think I tried to call, you have to call the station and couldn't get through or whatever. Um, and then some weeks later, uh, my friends and I were just at the mall uh, going into the record store. And I always went to the back where they had the import section 
just was like flipping through and I saw this 12 inch single that said the Smiths had never heard of them. Uh, thought it looked cool. I, I would buy things a lot just based on the album covers. Mm. Um, took it home, put it on. I was like, Oh my God, it's that song I heard. It's that song. It's the greatest song I've ever heard. Um, so it just kind of started like that. It was almost like an accident, you know? Um, and they just spoke to me. They spoke to us, you know, at mm. that time. They just became, you know, our favorite band. They really changed a lot for a lot of people. That's cool. So I thought one of the more interesting creative choices throughout the film was that you had intercut the narrative with a documentary about the Smiths. Why did you choose to do this? Um, a few reasons. I mean, there just came a point when I showed it to some friends uh, when we were cutting it, and I purposefully made sure none of them really knew the band. Um, and they were just a little bit confused about who the band were and why they were so uh, important. And, uh, you know, I make music documentaries. So someone just said, well, why don't you just cut a little documentary in there? And that will really help us out a lot. Um, and my first thought was like, ah, oh, more music licensing and archive costs. Um, yeah. But it, you know, we, we, uh, we found some great, uh, relatively affordable clips uh, and it just, it ended up working really beautifully. Uh, I just, I like having just a little touch of the reality of who they were and what they stood for uh, kind of threaded throughout, you know, mm. I think it really helps frame it, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I'm a music documentarian. It's nice to kind of insert a little bit of documentary into fiction. And we're kind of trying to do the flip side of that with some of the, the documentaries. So, you know, thought it was a good, uh, a good way to open the door for people. Oh, definitely. I knew that the Smiths were a big deal, but I didn't really know if there was music or a lot of the backstory. So having the documentary mm -hmm. there for me was definitely really helpful. And it brought good. it more into perspective. I'm like, oh yeah, they were pretty great. <laughs> so could you tell us a bit about the title, Shoplifters of the World? Yeah, um, it's uh, Shoplifters of the World Unite is one of the Smiths uh, greatest uh, songs um, came out on a 12 inch single uh, with Candy Darling on the cover. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just a great tune. It's really, you know, very typical of their uh, songwriting. Uh, it's got a great big uh, glam rock hook, but the lyrics are, you know, multi-layered, they're funny, they're literate, you know, uh, it's not about actual shoplifting. In fact, it's more about um, kind of cultural shoplifting, about um, appropriation and quoting and stealing from literary and artistic sources, which is kind of a lot of what of how that band put their music together. There's it's just deeply layered with quotes from books and plays and movies. Um, it's a really densely referential kind of songwriting, and we kind of extended that aesthetic into the script itself everything is kind of stitched together from lyrics and quotes from plays and old british films and uh things like that so uh yeah and so you know they just go through the night stealing little things from the world from each other um and it's just a rallying cry it's like it's an anthem for the outsider mm. wow that's amazing so how did the cinematographer Andrew Wheeler come to be a part of the project? Andrew Wheeler, what a dude. Um, he actually went to high school with Nick and Joe Manganiello. Oh. So they're old friends. Um, he was an old Mohawk punk back in high school, leather jacket, played in a hardcore band. Um, you'd never know it meeting him today. Um, but... Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he was a friend of theirs. We had somebody uh, lined up who ended up, I think, on a TV show or traveling abroad. And just all of a sudden, after years of developing it, the window opens and we have to shoot. And uh, he wasn't available. So Nick and Joe were like, got to call Wheels. He's your man. Um, and luckily, I mean, he's fantastic. You know, uh, he had done some features, he did some commercial work really sensitive, really good eye, uh, and just really brought, like he really pushed for like the wider aspect ratio. Um, and, you know, we had done a lot of work already to kind of build up the visual references of the world. And uh, yeah, he, he really took to it, had a great crew. 
and really delivered. I, I love, I love what he did. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. So which films or directors have influenced you as a filmmaker, but also the film Shop with Fears of the World? Um, everyone will always, I think, think it's, it's just a, a straight up John Hughes, like pretty in pink homage. And, you know, that is there. Um, but I remember enjoying those films when I was a, a, a youth. Uh, they didn't necessarily push me into filmmaking so much. I think when I got interested in filmmaking, I was finding filmmakers like Adam Agoyan, uh, Peter Greenaway, um, John Waters, uh, you know, um, I love uh, David Lynch and Patricia Rosema, you know, kind of the uh, uh, Almodovar is another favorite, kind of that second wave of great kind of international auteur cinema, like the art house stuff was really, really turned me on. Um, and for this, we really actually looked at more than anything, uh, American Graffiti and Diner. Uh, which are two total classics. It's just, it's like teenagers in cars at night in America, you know, and they're, they're kind of steeped in more like 50s, uh, 50s aesthetic, which is kind of this, the, the, the cinematic vibe that influenced a lot of the Smith stuff. So it's like, we're kind of create the 80s that were actually influenced by something a lot older, as opposed to an 80s movie inspired by the 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a, bit of a twist. Yeah, that's very really interesting. Kind of comes full circle. Yeah. So what are you currently working on? Are there any new projects that we should be looking out for? Yeah. Um, well, I wrote uh, a kind of a follow-up to Shoplifters. It's sort of set in 89. It's a different band. I'm kind of looking at like maybe doing an 80s trilogy. Um, can't really say who the band is yet, but it's definitely the flip side of the Smiths, Moody, Angst. Um, it's definitely going to be a lot more fun and a lot more queer and a lot more colorful and just really out there. Uh, can't wait to talk more about it soon. Uh, but in the meantime, we're, we're working on, I'm actually going back to a documentary and we're kind of back to the eighties, uh, telling the story of Rock Hudson, the, you know, the actor Rock Hudson, mm -hmm. who was one of the first really famous people to uh, die of AIDS. So we're going to be looking at the AIDS crisis of the eighties. Uh, and how his admission and his public uh, declaration of being HIV positive and having AIDS kind of changed the cultural conversation and public policy around it. So, you know, dealing with things like ACT UP and all that stuff, including a look back at his, uh, his, his career. So that should be cool. Awesome. So we'll be keeping yeah. our eyes peeled for that. Thank you so, so much for your time today. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Great talk to you.